The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I've been encouraged um, this week, uh, ma- mainly due to emails and things you hear from around the country, uh, to give a kind of a refresher. Uh, our dilemma is that our passion, just like the ministry was called from its inception, full stature. Our passion is to see maturity. Our passion is for character development. Our passion is that we no longer stay children, all right, with a low gospel, but rather a high gospel, one that appreciates the finished work of the cross, but appreciates taking up the cross daily and dealing and going from glory to glory, faith to faith, victory to victory. And uh, I was kind of surprised, read an article recently that there are, I thought everybody was like me and Jennifer thought everybody was like her. We were all passionate for more of God from the day we got saved. Did you know that we found out not everybody really wants to grow? They really don't want transformation? I was shocked. I I was going to blame the pastors for teaching a low-level Christianity, and it's not, the, it's not the pastors. There are multitudes of people that basically want Jesus to come into their heart, get saved, and then leave me alone. I'm going to live my life the rest the way I want to. I was shocked that there was so many. I, I have no comprehension of that. And I've pastored for years. And yet, when I read that, it, it still shocked me that there's people that want, like, they want fire insurance. They want saved. They'll acknowledge they need Jesus. But pretty much leave me alone. I'm going to live my life whatever way I want. So that's like Jesus is in you, but he's living a confined, restricted life. He's not really living his life through us because he might interfere with your likes and your dislikes. So I said, you know what? When we traveled, I'm going to give the message that we gave when we traveled church to church where the people knew nothing. And we saw the same mistakes over and over again. Um, I would say, uh, these are some churches, thousand member churches. We would say things like, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Point to Jesus. 98% of the people went and pointed to heaven. Christ in you. What's it going to take to get people, yes, he's in heaven, but... He wanted to bring heaven on earth by you inviting him into your life. Is he in you or not? You know, is there some kind of distance? And we found out, yes, there is. There's distance. But guess what? He didn't go anywhere. (laughs) With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. That's a potential possibility for any believer. Your heart can be one place, and your lip service can be say all the right answers. I was never impressed with right answers. I was impressed with right living. Somebody in victory. Now, next misconception is we want to teach lordship. Not baby Christianity, Jesus is my Savior and I'm all done. We want to teach how to make Jesus Lord and how to practice the presence of God 24-7. And what does that feel like for the average believer if you really are practicing His presence? Then peace would rule. Let the peace of God rule who's ruling? Jesus. Okay? Now, we would say, in order for Jesus to rule, you yield your will to His rule. We would say, point to your will. 99% of a congregation would point here. Therein lies the second major problem. It's not about mental assent. The will is here. This is the door of the heart. Jesus did not stand at the door of your head and knock. He stood at the door of your heart. And whether you knew it or not, you opened up your heart. I don't know what softened you, 
but somehow you opened up your heart whether you knew and then you said, I know that I know. I know that I know. Or I know that I know. <laughs> Didn't you ever hear people say it twice? The reason they're saying it twice is because you have, an, you have a spirit that knows and you got a head that knows stuff. But the spirit is designed for intimacy. The head was designed to learn to cooperate and subordinate to your spirit. And so I want to kind of, uh, this is a refresh. My people, you probably should know this inside out and backwards. Visitors and people that are watching for the first time on YouTube or Ustream, uh, you need this because I want to first of all cover some uh, misconceptions about forgiveness. First of all, the for misconception number one is forgiveness is like peeling an onion. How many have ever heard that? Yeah. Okay, see? Not that many, because you've been here too long. <laughs> Peeling an onion. That would be like saying, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I got born again, but it was like, for him to forgive me of my sin, he had to do it in layers. That's ridiculous, right? You wouldn't say that. Was it instant? I asked Jesus to come in. Saving grace. Jesus, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin, and I'll live for you and serve you all the days of my life. That was instant. Forgiveness is instant, but you'd be surprised if you don't know how to do it properly, but you're sincere. You develop a theology based on your bad experience. When I married Jennifer, you know, she's got her doctorate in theology, but when I married her, I was, she was trying to forgive somebody for, a, for two years. And I'm going... That's just not the way it works. <laughs> and was she sincere? There, there's part of the problem, isn't it? She was sincere. You don't try to forgive somebody for two years if you don't really want to. But that didn't mean she was doing it properly. Because forgiveness and repentance is a supernatural exchange. And the result of that exchange is peace. God does not play Pentecostal charismatic games. He will not put supernatural peace on a lie. So if, oh, that's, uh, that's the other one I've heard. Forgive and live with the pain. That's absurd, but it's, it's out there. Don't you talk like that. Forgive and live with the pain means there there really wasn't no supernatural transformation. It was mental assent. You went, I forgive that person. Yeah, if the pain is still there, only God can forgive sin. And if he tells you to forgive sin, then it's you and God that have to forgive, cooperate. And you can only do that from your spirit, not your head. If you do it from your head, you're doing it all by yourself and it doesn't work. Can you... Make that distinction. If you do it from the head, see, we need to learn the word you. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Who you, what you are we talking about? That's the carnal, fleshly, self-effort, mental ascent, you. But if I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, who's that person I'm talking about now? I'm talking about the new creation me. I'm talking about they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him, and we are doing it. And out of my belly flows the we. That's what I prayed for you to to enter into that replaced life to where there is a we consciousness. It's no longer I got sick. It's sickness has come upon us. Me and Jesus, we are one. And the goal is not only that we are a we, but it's a he that's going to live through my life. But we found that we got labeled inner healers. And our passion is abiding, John 15. But we found out you can't teach people to abide. You can't teach people to practice the presence of the Lord when they don't even know how to forgive properly. Everybody sees the forgiveness part. When that part is normative in your life, when it flows as a lifestyle, when it's easy, you start practicing the presence of God. You start moving toward an abiding life. You start moving toward a way to see that 
my goodness, I'm walking in the Lordship of Jesus. He's not just my Savior and He's living in a confined, restricted life. He's basically living His life through me and I can prove it because I have peace. If you have peace in your spirit, you're walking in the light that you have. Doesn't mean you don't need more light, but isn't it nice to know that at least I'm walking in the light that I have? There's a whole lot of stuff I don't know, but right now I've got peace with God. That means I'm at least right with Him and right with my brothers and sisters. And you can't just be right with God and be wrong with people. Now, forgive and live with the pain is nonsense. Forgive as an act of your will and God will take away the pain when He's ready to. Oh, <laughs> that's like if you've got bitterness in your heart towards somebody... And you say, oh, God, see, people have developed this based on their bad experience and not knowing how to do it, just like Jennifer couldn't do it for two years. So they say it must be hard. It must come in layers. It must be difficult because my experience dictated it. Not the word, but my experience. And some will say, uh, just forgive, and then Jesus in his good old time will come and sovereignly do the rest. So that's like saying Jesus wants you to stay in your sin of bitterness until he gets around to it. Some of this stuff's not even logical, but I know where it comes from. It comes from not doing it properly. Forgiveness is instant. It is not a process. Where the confusion comes is reconciliation, restoration. That's a process. Maturity, that's a process. That's not instant. But forgiveness and repentance is instant. And it's the walking it out later that causes you to mature and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. So, um, these are common, by the way. Raise your hand if you think these might be wrong. You're not sure. <laughs> My goodness. If you do it from here, forgiveness is instant every time. Every time. Jennifer was so blown away when we first got married and I walked her through a few things. She was so changed in less than 60 days. Her mentor saw her and her mentor was a Bible school president, school psychologist, Christian counselor. And she said Jennifer was too emotionally wounded to ever mount to anything. If you're not pretty well adjusted when you get saved, you only go so far. Now where is that in the Bible? You know what that came from? The experience of not seeing many people even get Christian counseling and change much. But you don't form your theology back on. Here I am, a baby Christian, six months old in the Lord. I get filled with the Holy Spirit. And shortly after that, people were sending me people because I was getting results. And the only reason I was getting results is when they say, when they would be talking about the pain and the hurt and the offenses that they had in their life and the emotional pain, when they would talk about it and they'd say, okay, I forgive Aunt Eleanor, but in here there was still bitterness. And by discernment, I would feel the bitterness and say, I would try to find a tactful way to say, actually, you didn't really forgive Aunt Eleanor yet. I hate to clue you in. But were they sincere? Yes, they were sincere. They were trying to forgive Aunt Eleanor. So I would just say, okay, well, put your hand down here and let Jesus do the forgiving. Now, who's really doing the forgiving? Jesus and you. When it's here. When it's here, it's just you. When it's here, it's God and you joined together and out of your belly flows. And they would say, okay. And sometimes they didn't even know what they were doing, but they would all of a sudden just relax down here and say, I let, I let forgiveness flow to Aunt Eleanor. And I say, can you feel the peace? And they go, yeah. It's that simple. No peace, you didn't do it right, no matter how sincere you were. Therein lies the battle. Twelve years of traveling church to church to church. We had to deal with that. We wanted to teach the deeper truths of God. We wanted to teach how to abide. We wanted John 15 to be a life experience, abiding in the vine and what it means. And how if there is a disconnect, how you get back in and live in that realm. And we couldn't because they lived with anxiety, which is the opposite of prayer. 
Doesn't the scripture say, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer? And prayer isn't all talking. Prayer is being with someone. And when peace rules, you're with him. And that is prayer as an attitude of the heart. And you can even function at work from the place of peace and still be in an attitude of prayer. I like to speak in tongues and pray in tongues uh, during my my private time and during on the road, especially on the road. How many know you need to pray in tongues on the road? All right. You got you have all of God's wonderful people on the road, and he placed them just where he wanted to place them so that you could see what's in your heart. <laughs> to keep you seeing if you're abiding or practicing the presence of God, correct? And that slow person, he placed them there strategically. All temptation, that when I'm joined to the Lord and I'm one spirit with Him, all temptation is to pull me out of that union. Isn't it? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. It's to pull me out of that union and get me to operate independently and go, Hey, you jerk, what did you just do? Right? And then you go, Oops. I receive forgiveness. I get back into union with God. And if I have my peace, I did it right. Hmm? That's how you maintain a walk with God. But there's so many misconceptions about forgiveness. There's, and there's a fourth one that's actually, uh, uh, here's a complicated term, Sandermanian antinomianism. How do you like that one? It was a heresy that was dealt with, and it's covered in, in the epistle to 1 John to where you just uh, ask for forgiveness once, you never have to ask for it again. And Martin Luther was attacked with the same heresy. So it goes back to the early church, and it goes it's a repetitive thing, just a different name. But it's basically that you don't ever have to forgive or repent again because you did it at salvation. And we're trying to bring most of the church doesn't even know how to do it properly. So that would come along, would be very popular, wouldn't it? Hmm? You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to do it. Everything's been done, past, present, and future. But you don't ever have to forgive again. We'll appeal to the people who've been in bondage to the law. They don't know what. They're bummed out. Christianity's not working. I say the better way is teach them how to make it work. Teach them how to deal with the offense that it doesn't work. Teach them how to deal with offenses in the body of Christ because what it does is it liberates you. So many people are afraid to forgive that they're afraid that it lets somebody off the hook. The one that lets off the hook is you. If you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. Worry about your condition before God, not what someone else is going to happen to someone else that offended you. Grace is God's power working through us. It's more than unmerited favor. It's both applied to initial salvation as, as well as our Christian walk. Now, um, I've done this one before, but it's important. Who is actually doing the forgiving, Jesus or you? Come on, who's doing the forgiving? And? And you, unless you forgive. But that you has to, be the, has to be the new creation, you or it doesn't work. How do you know if the right you did it? Peace. peace. And he's the spirit of truth. He will not put peace on a lie. First John 2, 3 and 6. By this we know that we know Jesus if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. And I believe that what God is doing right now is teaching us how the power of God can flow through our human spirit, how we no longer just rest in the fact that we're saved 
and live a confined, restricted life, but how in the marketplace can I let him flow out? How can I allow him to be Lord, not just my Savior? And for the benefit of the people who are wounded, there's multitudes of people don't go to church anymore. They either got beat down with religion or blamed somebody, but you know, the important thing is to recognize that it's not an option. It's a commandment. Unless you forgive, your Heavenly Father can't forgive you. I would certainly want to know if I'm doing it right. Now, here's the part that I think we need to see. And especially people that are watching, you don't go to church anymore because you were offended. Well, no matter whether it was a legitimate offense or you made it up in your own head, which does happen, by the way. Do you know people have make-believe offenses? See that person on the cell phone over there? I know they're talking about me. Okay. All right. Listen to this. The benefits of a supernatural exchange of walking in a forgiveness lifestyle. Number one, you walk out of the prison of that offense and that bondage. You walk out of the jail. Nobody has to come and do it for you. You, responding to the Lord in you, walk out of that offense. There's people watching right now. You quit going to church and you have all these reasons why you quit going to church. I've heard them all, 42 years. But guess what? You are in a prison of your own making. And no, you don't have a great walk with God. And no, that other excuse, I'm part of the larger body of Christ. I can remember being a baby Christian, and I had people, I loved, I love, I love those people in, I forget what country in Africa it was, but I love the people in, say, Kenya. And they were adamant about how missionary-minded they were, and they got along with no one in the church. They were a walking disaster in interpersonal relationships. But they loved these people they never met. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty easy, isn't it? To love people you never met. And you can sound real religious in it, but if you can't get along this way, you aren't walking in God. If you can't say, God, I love, it's these people I can't walk in relationship with. <laughs> I mean, come on. The only one that believes that is you, and I don't even think you really believe it. So benefit number one is you walk out of the prison into liberty. Benefit number two, I love this. This is selfish even. When you do it from the heart, you feel better. Anybody have a problem with feeling better? <laughs> when you forgive and it changes to peace, it feels better than that every time you see that person. Do you not want to feel better? You need deliverance. All right. <laughs> The third one, oh, you're going to love this. After you forgive and you feel peace, any decision you make is better. Can you imagine being angry at your kids? I know none of you have ever done that. But if you, be, imagine being angry at your kids and not dealing with forgiveness and then discipline them. Whoa, I bet that they'd get a... I'm just going to kill those kids. That's what I'm going to do. That's the kind of decision you make when you don't deal with the heart first. All right? So do you believe you'd make better decisions? Yes. Uh-huh. At least less harsh. Yes. <laughs> All right. So you walk out of prison. You feel better because the pain's gone. The third one is, you make better decisions. How can you object to this? You should fall in love with the forgiveness message. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. Fourth, oh, I love this. The barriers to emotional growth. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow you. Our favorite example of this was Jennifer and I looked at each other. We were in a, it was a Golden Dawn grocery store. 
And a man with a three-piece suit on lunch break went like this. At the top of his lungs, I can't even do it as good as he did it, but his face was beat red. And he's going, I wouldn't buy anything in this store ever again, and I want everybody to know that. And Jennifer and I looked at each other, emotional damage, age three. Can a, can a 50-year-old act like a three-year-old in public? Sure can. I'm lucky I didn't backslide when I first married Jennifer, and we did traveling ministry, and she was... She told me about it later. I'm glad I didn't see it. I might, have, I might have backslid. I don't know. But she said she was going down the, with her shopping cart in a grocery store, going down the aisle, and a guy came and like, Pah! like, you dumb woman, you. You're in my way. And he made some obscene gestures because she was going this way when he was going this way. Like, you can't go around somebody? That kind, that kind of, that kind of, immaturity can happen in an older person. If you don't learn to forgive properly every last little bitty thing that God ever shows you, you basically stunt your emotional growth. And don't tell me how biblically knowledgeable you are. You're emotionally still a child with a lot of information, (laughs) which makes you dangerous. And then some of them become leaders. Some of them become preachers. Oh, my goodness. So you've got an adolescent training up people with lots of Bible knowledge, but a stunted emotional growth. But here's the beautiful thing. Every time you walk in supernatural forgiveness, where it changes to peace, that's the inner witness, and he's the spirit of truth. He won't put peace on a lie. You remove the barrier, and it's not instant, but you suddenly allow, like time-lapse photography, how many know what that is? Where it accelerates, maturity can now move in an accelerated rate because the, the, the limit on the emotions has been removed. You remove that limitation, and all of a sudden you're no longer acting like a 3-year-old, you're acting more like a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, but you mature spiritually and you cannot mature spiritually beyond what the emotions allow now is that a pretty good benefit you start to grow up emotionally regardless of chronological age here's the fifth one every time you forgive and feel the peace of god you are engrafting more of the god nature You are becoming a partaker of the divine nature, and you're engrafting his nature. That's how you grow in grace and in knowledge. You're growing in the divine nature. A residue of his presence is remaining permanently on the other side of forgiveness and repentance. There is a measure of his divine nature that's being preserved in you. It's like... It's almost like we should be, I saw in Jude where it says, picked by the Father and preserved in Jesus. I thought of jelly. (laughs) Picked by the Father and preserved in Jesus. What does preserves do? They have the same flavor as when they were fresh. And so it's like, I want to be, I was picked by God. I was picked out of the sheepfolds and God basically blessed me and broke me and then distributed me. That's what he did. Did you notice that? Oh, I shared this on uh, communion once. It's a beautiful picture. How many remember that on the road to Emmaus that Jesus was walking with them and they didn't recognize him? Remember that? Until the breaking of bread. And what did he do? He took the bread. He blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. And that is a picture of what he wants to do with you and I. Look at David. He took David from the sheepfolds. He sent Samuel and blessed David. He took him. 
He blessed him, and then he broke him in the school of hard knocks. And that's these gentlemen over here. The school of hard knocks is going to be better than any Bible school, better than any Bible study. God's basically going to take you and say, in the school of hard knocks, you're learning that relationship with Jesus, and you're learning how to navigate in the real world and not religiosity. He took David, he blessed him and anointed him king under Samuel, the first anointing, and then he broke him by allowing him to face Saul's aggression for years. That made the man. And it's just like Jesus. Before God makes mighty ministry, he makes a mighty man. The ratio for Jesus was 10 to 1. 30 years making of the man and learning obedience by the things that he suffered for three years of ministry. We've got people that want to go into ministry because they know the Bible and they don't, know, they don't know the life of being broken and being available for God to train you in the school of hard knocks and in life. I used to train my people for the church. It almost looked like a circus. I had four worship teams, flags, banners, uh, mime, dance. I had everything, but they were all trained for in the building. And God says, that's great. I've taught you how to equip the saints. But now I want to teach you from this point on, you're going to teach them how to live in the marketplace where they spend 99% of their life. Not in the building. But those same principles apply. He's going to take you. He's going to bless you. And He anointed you when you got saved. But then He's going to break you. Because he wants your character and he wants your heart more than he wants your opinions or your strengths. And then after he breaks you, he has something of value to distribute to others that will benefit others. You are meant for others. You are meant for other people. Can you see where this applies to everybody? Yep. He took you. He blessed you. going to break you. But then he's going to distribute you. Is David in the Bible still speak to you today? Is he still ministering today? So that, that breaking from Saul was a very small thing compared to the legacy that he has remained in the anointing, hasn't it? He is still ministering to us today. Now, benefit number five, those emotions are grafted into your life. They become they, you own them. It's like what you read in the Bible when it's written on the tablet of my heart. Benefit number six. You become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Your discernment is increased because from the place of peace you know what's going on in the atmosphere. If you're not at the place of peace, if you're anxious, you don't know what's going on. It's blocking sensitivity to the spirit if you're angry hurt fear lust anger guilt shame any toxic emotion is in the way you are unaware of what's going on in the spirit unless it comes upon you <laughs> on the from the outside i've seen people that were really distraught and they wanted to just stand by someone who was okay because they could feel peace coming from them but ultimately, you want the peace in you, not coming from someone else. Really, I had a troubled lady once in my first pastor. She said, Pastor, can I just stand by you? Because it's the only time I feel calm. And I'm saying, that's fine, but I want to teach you how to get calm yourself between you and the Lord, all by yourself. So, benefit number six, sensitivity to God's presence increases. Number seven, it's very similar, but the anointing in your life increases. That's good. The anointing increases. More of Him flowing through your life, unrestricted. Whenever you forgive something permanently and it changes to peace, it's like there is a, a, a river that is now opened up that flows automatically without effort. Do you ever see a sieve, you know what I'm talking about, with all the little holes in it? Yeah. Or like a colander that you drain, something, all those little holes. Every time you forgive, there's like another river. 
out of my belly flows rivers of living water. Every time you forgive and you're walking in that freedom, there's a flow of life and anointing that's flowing out toward you. That's why when you see if an alcoholic or a drug addict gets totally delivered, they could just talk about anything. They could talk about, boy, this is a great Monday, this is a great Tuesday, this is a great Wednesday, and people are getting convicted. Because <laughs> there's a flow of their deliverance that's flowing out into the atmosphere. And a lot of times it's not what they say, but basically the anointing that's drawing people to them. Benefit number seven then is an increase in anointing. Benefit number eight. Oh, this is a terrible one. Oh. The CDC says 90% of emotional, I mean of, of physical illnesses are emotionally based. All of a sudden you start walking in better health and you even get surprised by some physical healings that you weren't even trying to get. We had a young man, 20 years old, up in Groton, Connecticut. He stood the altar, just sobbed that he knew he had to forgive his father. He, 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 was, he loved God, but he just knew that he just never went there. He just didn't want to forgive him. He forgave his father, was instantly healed of color blindness. What does that have to do with anything? I don't understand it, but I do know this, that the emotions are attached to certain disorders. God made, gave you equipment in you for your protection. He gave you an HPA system, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenaline, so that you could run from lions. Right? So you would have supernatural strength. Your child is under, under, caught under something and you all of a sudden momentarily that rush of adrenaline rises up and you can secure something in a difficult situation. But you weren't meant or created in your physical body to run from lions all day long. That, that was God's defense mechanism for an emergency. To be able to think quick, to swerve the car out of the way and prevent an accident. He gave you another system called the immune system. The immune system protects your inner body. Right? You're all familiar with that. When you talk bad about yourself and you refuse to forgive yourself, you're telling your body, I'm no good. And you can actually make yourself sick. Your immune system can eventually, not instantly, but eventually your immune system will, will agree with your stinking attitude toward yourself. Do you know how sinful it is to hold unforgiveness toward yourself? And not only do you need to forgive yourself, you know, fail, but be a, don't be a failure. There's a big difference. Get up. It's not how many times you fall down. It's whether or not you get up again. And guess what? You will make mistakes. You will fail. That's part of life. But it's how you, do, how you respond to it. Learn from it. Do what's right now afterwards. Did you learn something from it? You know, I don't want to do that again. That didn't work. <laughs> huh? So basically, the benefit is all of a sudden, you start forgiving yourself. And here's something I've, I've run into this week. Because uh, I talk to people from all around the country, literally around the world, and when I see a pattern, it always gets my attention that this is something God wants to address. And you know what I saw? I saw people who were hamstrung in their relationship with the Lord because they needed to receive forgiveness themselves. And in addition to receiving forgiveness, some of them knew to do that, receive forgiveness, release themselves from demands and expectations that God didn't put on them. They put it on themselves. Do you think you're capable of doing that? Huh? Do you put, it, do you put stuff on you that God didn't put on you? You just thought that you'd raise the standard. I remember David Wilkerson once got rebuked by the Lord. I was very proud that he shared it publicly. He said, David, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. But David, you're making it straighter and narrower than I ever did. That's something you do to yourself. Come on, before we even go any further, I received forgiveness for bad-mouthing myself. If I made a mistake, I received forgiveness, but it's health to my physical body. If I don't talk bad about myself, my body's going to end up agreeing with it. I've seen people healed of allergies when they forgave themselves. Does that make sense? Anything that they say is uh, autoimmune disease. Why not start 
by just getting before the Lord. Sure, pray for your healing, but what's wrong with saying, God, if I'm judging myself unnecessarily, if I'm putting demands and expectations on me that God didn't put on me, I put them on me. I release myself from those demands and expectations, and I place the demands and expectations on the Lord to be my Lord and to guide me and direct me. And health and healing starts flowing to your physical body. Benefit number nine. This should be first, <laughs> but most people are too selfish to appreciate this first, so I saved it for last. <laughs> I receive forgiveness for being selfish. You please God. <laughs> Shouldn't that be first? Huh? When you forgive, you please God. I can remember him taking me to the school of prayer. And when I closed my eyes, I wasn't getting anything. I'm not getting a word. I'm not, do you ever do that? I'm not getting a word. I'm not getting anything. And God said, when you closed your eyes, you honored me. And my heart would just melt. And it was being with him. And then stuff would come. Then you'd get your scripture. Then you would get your, your insight. But he wanted me first. And I wasn't trying to get something from him. I needed him. When you prioritize and close your eyes and say, when I close my eyes, I'm honoring God, that pleases God. And when you forgive, it brings pleasure to His heart. And His will is pleasure. Okay. Are you all happy now? You all forgiven yourself? Just for the record, I'm going to give the thing that you really don't need to hear, but I'm going to give you the toxic effects of unforgiveness. You're disobedient to God, and you definitely don't please Him when you walk in unforgiveness. You have emotional torment inside. Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> you live primarily in the carnal emotions. That means what is in you most of the time is hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. More than peace. And we've got plenty of Christians that live in low-grade anxiety 90% of the day. That is not God's best for you. You could deal with those fears in less than 60 days and get the bulk of those clusters dealt with one at a time. It's not that hard. Fourth toxic effect of unforgiveness, you stunt your emotional growth. Remember what that looked like? I don't want to look like that, do you? Hmm? I did that once in my first church, and I had to confess before the whole church. I pulled into a drugstore parking lot, and I couldn't, I had a standard transmission, and I was trying to back the packed the truck out and there was a guy with a big cowboy hat and he wasn't paying any attention he was driving a big truck and he was driving right toward me and just in the split second I got that shift gear in the right place and I went like this uh, and right when I went uh, no, no obscene gesture just uh, just like that he looked at me and the Lord spoke and said why don't you invite him to your church I forgave him, I received forgiveness, but it, God kept pressing me, you tell your church. So I told the church. I said, boy, did I mess up, gave the story of the guy, a cowboy hat, the truck, and it almost run me over, and just in the nick of time, I got out of the way, and I went, ah, and the Lord said, invite him to church. So I told that story, and people love it if you blow it. They might not have remembered anything else in that sermon that day, but they remembered that story when the pastor blew it. So now, I'm going for, I used to walk two miles a day, kind of a fast walk around the neighborhood, and, and I'm in this fast walk, and I'm praying, and I'm going, Lord, that, that response was so quick. I'm ashamed of that. I want to bring a death blow to that. And, and, and I could feel the presence of God, and I was receiving forgiveness and cleansing, and I didn't want that reaction to rise up like that. And I'm doing this, and all of a sudden, the car comes down the street and almost runs me off the road. And I went, 
this time I, went, I waved, I'm, you know, like, sorry. But then when I looked down, I wasn't doing anything wrong. The car turns around, and it's going to run me off the road again. And I'm going, and I'm smiling, but I'm like, I don't know what to do. But there was no anger. There was no reaction. So then I went around the corner. This car follows me and starts honking the horn. And I went, and I'm blessing them, and I'm praying them. And all of a sudden, a redheaded lady with sunglasses flung open the driver's side door, rolled in the grass, laughing hysterically. And she goes, Pastor, you passed the test. But you know I had to testify the following Sunday. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna lay my sin out before them, I'm gonna lay out my victories too, right? And isn't it isn't it interesting that the whole two mile walk was how to abide and how to respond in the spirit as opposed to react in the flesh. So I passed. At least that time. <laughs> Your emotional growth is stunted. We know what that looks like. Toxic effect number five, you make bad decisions. If you're at work and you're stressed, don't make a decision. Let it go to you get your peace back. Then make a decision. It'll be better timing, better, and you can discern. You know, somebody could lay a contract on your desk that sounds too good to be true. But if you're all upset, you really don't know what God has to say about it. But when you're at peace, and then you don't feel comfortable with it, you can put it on hold. But when you don't have peace, you don't know. You've got to go with your head. And quite frankly, your gut knows more than your head knows. And if your business or your job is really owned by the Lord, then you let Him run it. And you learn to pay more attention to your spirit, a little less attention to reason. You know, a lot of times your reason, it's amazing, you know, it's like a, a lot of times people just use greed and say, God's blessing me. Well, no, you're cheating that client. It's not God blessing you just because they're gullible. All right? So you make better decisions from the place of peace because then you have a green light or a red light. And you need to live that way. And God will prosper you um, in that honesty and that integrity. Toxic emotion number six, unforgiveness causes you to hurt people even when you're not planning on it. Hurt people, hurt people. It's like if you've got barbed wire wrapped around you, all you, you get close to anybody, you're going to stick them. Hurt people, hurt people. Even when you think, oh no, it's just me. Well, you need to forgive yourself. But hurt people, hurt people. Offended people make up scenarios in their head that will hurt other people, even if they're not real. I once prayed with a lady. They sent me a lady because a psychologist was having trouble. This person believed that the CIA was coming in in the middle of the night and injecting her. All right, so she, she, was, she needed uh, some real oversight. And they said, Dennis, would you pray with her? So I, did. I don't know what to do, but she was a believer. And I said, you've got Jesus living in your heart, and you, 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 you love God. And she goes, yes, I do. And there's times she could be pretty normal. And, and so I said, well, how about close your eyes, and we're just going to pray, because she had all these fears. So I said, well, the CIA people that come in and inject you at night? Mm-hmm. And I could feel the fear manifested when she thought of it. I said, release forgiveness to them. She released forgiveness to them, and the psychologist said they saw progressive improvement from that time on. I got her to forgive imaginary people. How many of you need to forgive imaginary offenses? Huh? Because that sounds extreme. But you know, you make up offenses where so-and-so snubbed me, so-and-so did this, somebody walked past me. I'll tell you what, that's paranoia. That's the opposite of discernment. That's a spirit of suspicion. And you don't have any evidence for that. You concocted that in your mind. And trauma. I want to get on the trauma kick one of these days. I want to do the whole teaching on trauma. Did you know trauma is based on how big you make it? Now, I'm not minimizing uh, 
all my friends went through Vietnam, and I know how horrific war was. But at the same time, there are people who one person's trauma is another person's bad experience. So I said, we could learn to say, I'm not going to make mountains out of a molehill. That you can have a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil, or you can have a big, big devil and an itsy bitsy God. We'll get into that some other time. I'm not minimizing people with pain. I've seen people in pain, especially from war. All right? But it can be addressed in God because God is so much bigger than that trauma. But the trauma begins to take on a life of its own and it feels bigger than it really is. And so we need to pray for those people because there's hope in Jesus. The next toxic, and this is the one that concerns me the most. No, not the most, because if you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father don't forgive you. That concerns me most. But your health deteriorates. Even childhood unforgiveness that's harbored over a long period of time becomes the adult's diseases. So it would be wise to even teach your children and your grandchildren how to forgive properly. And I like to, when we taught at Comenius, I liked the, the third graders, was my favorite group. The third graders just had wisdom and insight. But I liked it when they said, you have to forgive from the heart because that's where the living water is. Everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Isn't that cute? So they knew just doing it from the head wasn't going to work. You had to do it from your heart. But then you also have to teach the church that this is not the heart we're talking about. Right? All right. We're going to seal this work, but I'm going to have Jennifer explain one thing that she doesn't know I'm going to do this to her. I want her to explain the first and second brain. Because the, the confusion is, and I see people when they worship, do you ever see people in worship go like this? They mean well. They mean from the heart. You know, Jesus is my own. It's not, but that's not where your heart is. This is the epicenter. Your spirit fills your head to toe, but the epicenter, the door, the conscience, uh, the seat of the emotions, uh, <laughs> it's all here. This is where you either permit or forbid. If Terry started walking toward me and I thought he don't like me and I want to protect myself, what's the first thing I do when Terry comes at me? I put up a wall down here, right? You know what that is, that wall? Nod your head. You know what I'm talking about because you do it. You know what you just did? You cut Jesus out of the scenario and you decided to protect yourself with a carnal wall. So now Jesus is saying, okay, you're going to handle Terry by yourself. He's coming at you and he's, he's going to say something negative. And he says something negative. Guess what? It goes right through that carnal wall and you get slimed. Or... Terry could come walking toward you and go, oh boy, Terry doesn't like me. Oh, Jesus, drop down and let peace guard your heart. Anything he says cannot penetrate the peace of God. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. Your heart and your mind. That's the armor of God. And anything anybody says negatively cannot penetrate peace. Now, Well, as far as your heart, we always start with what does the Bible say? And... When Dennis was teaching me this and about the door of the heart down here, it made sense to me that Jesus said, out of your belly, and the word used in the Greek is the actual word belly. It's not the Greek word heart there. And in the New Testament, belly, bowels of compassion, that those are more accurate than the newer translations. And also in the Hebrew, it talks about the reins, the kidneys, the bowels, and those are the actual words used. And so when Dennis was teaching me this, I was real excited to learn from Scripture that Scriptures corroborated what he was teaching me about functioning from the heart in the gut. Well, in 1999, a groundbreaking book was published written by a gastroenterologist that caused a huge uproar in the entire field of biology. He called the book The Second Brain, that what Michael Gershon discovered 
is that we have not only a thinking brain in the head, the central nervous system, but we have an emotional brain in the gut. And not now, by the way, he is studying to try to help people who have gastrointestinal problems because they haven't forgiven. Unfortunately, he's not a Christian and we can't send him a book <laughs> to help these people, but he's on the right track. Now, what, ha what he discovered, we have an entirely separate nervous system in the gut, the enteric nervous system. He coined that term. And these two nervous systems cooperate by one nerve, the left vagus nerve, that goes from the emotional processor in your thinking brain but your thinking brain doesn't send messages to your gut. Your gut tells your thinking brain how you feel. In the process of embryonic development, starting about the third week, the embryo has a clump of tissue called the neural crest, which will form all the nerves in the body. And about three weeks, those cells start to migrate and approximately half of them go to your thinking brain. The other half goes to your gut and forms a lining of sheaths of nerves around your esophagus, your stomach, your intestine, your bowels. This is your second brain, your emotional brain. And guess what? Guess which brain rules? Your emotional brain rules your behavior, rules your thoughts, rules your decisions. So if we don't get it right in the gut through forgiveness, we are going to pay a price in our physical bodies, in our relationships, in our decisions, and it will lead to all those negative uh, toxins caused by unforgiveness. And you can know all the right answers oh. in your head, but the head can never override what the heart believes. And for those who would say that your physical heart plays a big part in this, this is not true. There are millions and millions of neurons in your central nervous system and in your enteric nervous system. There are about 40,000 neurons that maintain your heartbeat regular, keep your heartbeat regular. So we've got computer, computer, computer chip. And the only... And, and the, of course your physical heart is affected by your emotions, but it doesn't contribute anything either to your thinking brain, anything emotional, either to your thinking brain or your emotional brain. And the easiest way to explain it, if there was suddenly a loud crash in this room, neuropeptides, right? Neuropeptides are molecules, molecules of, of emotion, emotion would go to your entire body before this even knew what happened. Right? If you heard something, you jump, you would feel the reaction to the noise before the head, the head would have to catch up, oh, a ladder fell in the other room. This informs this. Amen? I'll explain the neuropeptides another time. Yes. That was your Thank science you. lesson for today. That was your science lesson for today. We had a little time left over, so we wanted to put a little science teaching in there. But um, can you see how important that basically we wanted to teach on abiding. We want to teach you to move into the deeper things of God, into, into a genuine work of the cross to bring a maturity to the body of Christ. And yet when we traveled, we were basically teaching unless, Matthew 18, unless you forgive from the heart. That's sad. That's sad. They don't know where the heart's at, and they're not forgiving properly. And they've even made up theology for being stuck in unforgiveness for years and months. That it must just be hard. I want to teach the deep things of God, but every place we went, we're seeing what the body needs. I'm believing that there's an awakening that's already begun, 
And as it moves forward, some of these things are going to become a little more automatic. Things that we're teaching step by step are going to become a little more automatic. And hopefully people will just start doing stuff from the heart. Right? Amen. Are any, any of you challenged to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle? Yes. yes. Here's the way you do it. For, let's do it for the sake of visitors. I'm going to pray, pray you through in a group. Just close your eyes. And instead of you searching, we're going to say, I want to do it the Bible way, God search. Search me for anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. You see the emotion attached to the choices and the emotions attached to the mind. Hurtful, anxious thoughts. What kind of thoughts? emotional thoughts, anxious thoughts, what kind of ways, what kind of choices, hurtful choices, hurtful ways. We have to deal with the hurt and the anxious to resolve the other two. So Father, search me. First person or situation comes to mind, just nod your head. Feel the feeling down in the gut that's attached. Every thought, every thought has a corresponding emotion. They're in feeling thought bundles. Got the feeling? Now let the Jesus in you from the heart, from the heart, let forgiveness flow to that and through that feeling till it changes to peace. Let rivers of living water flow out of you until it changes to peace. If you're watching by Ustream or YouTube, you're watching by video, you're doing that at home. That's you and your Jesus. He's the forgiver on the inside, flowing out of you. That new creation you joined together with the Lord is allowing a river to flow from the belly. It doesn't flow from the head. It flows from the belly. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. Out of the abundance of the heart now, my mouth will speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed. You're all clean. Don't. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.